One of my favorite things in gaming is when you spend a lot of time building up to one big moment in the second act. Borderlands 2's Assault on the Bunker is an excellent example of building up to a moment that gives the player the shot in the arm they need to carry themselves through the final act. I guess more so a shot in the chest. A key to a great moment is in this section. You spend hours building up to it. When you get to it, there's a lot happening and it's very exciting to play. There's some twists and turns in it too. It ends by leaving the characters and players broken while changing the status quo of the world. Providing great motivation to see this story through while teasing the last act. Set up, pay off, change everything. A better example of this is in the title of the video. Xenoblade Chronicles nails every aspect of its midpoint. While it's still a very good game before you reach Prison Island, atop it is when- Spoilers for the first half of the game. If you care, please click off. This moment is so impactful that it kind of ruins your first experience with the game if you know this twist going in. God knows Smash has been doing its best to spoil this moment. I could honestly do a video on the opening and ending of this game alongside this one, but I'm in university. And as much as I would love to get three videos out this month celebrating the release of Xenoblade 3, I do not have the time. So right now, let's just look at the key takeaways from the opening. Everybody lives on absolutely massive titans that fought many lifetimes ago. Homs live on the Bionis, and Mechons live on the Mechonis. They don't like each other. The only thing that can easily kill the Mechon is a strange sword called the Monado. Only Dunban over there can wield it until the sword said F you and zapped his arm. This guy Mumkar is very happy about that, and then he most definitely 100% dies. Fast forward a bit and the Mechon have chilled out. During this part of the opening, we get to know the characters and the world. Shulk is the lead. He's currently researching the Monado and is being guided by this dude, Dixon. Ryan is the meathead best friend. Fiora is also a very close friend and is Dunban's sister. The Mechon stop being chill and attack. Shulk takes the Monado and it starts to give him visions that save his life. Something it never did for Dunban. Sadly for him, he gets a vision of this faced Mechon killing Fiora and he's unable to save her. And gives us one of the best screams in any JRPG. I'll kill you! The Mechon dip and this provides Shulk with the motivation to do two things. One, destroy all Mechon. Two, use his visions to prevent anyone else from dying. And that's really the main plot and his main motivation throughout the first half of the game. Fighting robots that eat people to avenge Fiora. Shulk and Ryan set out and Dunban will join them later. From the end of the opening all the way to the midpoint, everything that happens is to show the lengths that Shulk will go through to save people using his visions. Ryan, Sharla, a medic, who isn't even the best healer in the game, and Melia, will all be saved by Shulk's visions, and the latter ones will join the party afterwards. After Sharla's brother is saved, a different faced Mechon shows up and kidnaps him, and it starts to hint towards the reveal that will happen in the midpoint. You save Juju, and then that face Mechon does some more teasing. It's important to note that a lot of the visions that Shulk gets during the first half of the game are stuff that's going to happen in the near future. But he starts to get visions of the midpoint pretty early on. There's a lot of stuff that happens during those visions, but the key takeaway for Shulk is that Melia's father is going to be killed and that's something they all want to prevent from happening. Dixon points Shulk towards where the visions might be taking place. Prison Island. During the first half of the game, there's also a lot of taunting from the Mechon that killed Fiora, Metal Face. Dunban rejoins the party. Kiropon Ricky joins the party exclusively because his children ate so much and put him into debt. Which is good because he's the best healer in the game. We continue to see Shulk getting visions and saving people with them. And there are some scenes hinting towards something bigger. Another character, Alvis, is introduced and he can seemingly wield the Monado. He is definitely very sus. We also finally meet Melia's father and the people he leads, the Hyantia. When we reach the midpoint, Shulk has become confident in his and his friend's abilities to save people using the visions. And the game has set up what's about to go down for a long time, introducing the key players and the relevant aspects of the world. The last bit of the game has been building up to this moment, and the gang believes they are able to save the Emperor's life. <laughs> Emperor! 
the mech on attack to kill someone that's on Prison Island. The Emperor heads to the island to fend off the attackers. Something that will lead to his death. He uses his bloodline's power to release what was sealed away on Prison Island. He hopes it will save his people. A giant is revealed and tells him to use the power of the island. And he uses it to cast Thunderbolt. When the party reaches the island, a connection between a species of monsters called the Telethia and the Hyantia are teased. And Shulk gets a vision of the giant doing something to the Monado. The party reaches the top. Shulk is determined to prevent the Emperor's death and to avenge Fiora. I have no evidence to prove that Ryan knows what's happening. Sharla is here to avenge her fiance. Dunban is over there. Melia is here to save her father. And Ricky can't go home, so he's just vibing with the party. The giant Zanza claims that he was the one that made the Monado. He tells Shulk that he's been waiting for him and proceeds to go on a lore dump about the strange sword. He claims that the High Entia sealed him away because they fear the power of the Monado. The TLDR of what he says is that the Monado can manipulate ether, the baseline for all life on the Bionis. But it's shackled, and the constraints on it are why faced Mechon are immune to it. Which is why Shulk was unable to save Fiora at the beginning of the game. Metalface notices that Zanza is free and gets ready to yeet a special spear at him. Zanza says he can power up the Monado if he's free. Seems legit. Melia asks Shulk not to do it because she has a bad feeling about this. But Shulk is too focused on avenging Fiora. He frees Zanza as the spear cuts through the barrier and penetrates him. Oh. Metal Face reveals that they were only here to kill Zanza, and this new Silver Face Mechon tries to speak with him. Their conversation is the third act showing up in the second act. Shulk interrupts them because if they kept talking, it would have spoiled some twists too early. That was only here to tease, not to reveal. Metal Face taunts Dunban by name, leading to him figuring out the twist that's about to happen. Silver Face tries to stop the fighting. It doesn't go well. The Emperor saves Dunban's life. It doesn't go well for him. Shulk, upset that he failed to save someone else, hears Zanza's voice in his head, telling him that the shackles have been broken. The Monado 2 is born. Shulk goes sicko mode and absolutely f***s up Metal Face. Silver Face jumps in to save him. As the body of the mech falls apart, it's revealed that Ahams is piloting it. She pleads with Zanza while he figures out how the face mechon were immune to the Monado. This is what Zord was hinting at. The reason why face mechon were immune to the power of the Monado was because they existed outside of the natural balance of the world. And now that we have the Monado too, we can harm all life. While all of this has big story implications, all that remains is to show who's piloting Silverface. And there's only one person that can make this moment land as hard as it does. Fiora. Fiora finishes her lines hinting at the end game and the mech on retreat, leaving Shulk destroyed. There's a lot to Xenoblade Chronicles 1. So much that I'm worried I left out some very important details. Ultimately though, the first half of this game is about fighting man-eating robots. There are a lot of things that hint towards something bigger, like the face mech on twist. From the party's point of view, they're fighting to avenge their loved ones. And in this moment, the game changes everything while setting up the final act. It's no longer a game about people fighting man-eating robots. There's a whole lot more going on. After the party leaves, Alvis shows up to talk to Zanza, and they set up what's to come. Just because we finished what the game has been building to, doesn't mean we're done here. There's a whole lot of game left. Now, why? Obviously, the Fiora reveal. It's perfect for one reason. How it changes the motivation of the main characters. Why did Shulk, Ryan, and Dunban start their journeys? What event happened that motivated Shulk to save as many people as possible? Fiora's death. He failed to save her after getting a vision, and he's never going to let that happen ever again. And here she is, in the flesh. Well, like 10% flesh. But it doesn't just affect the people that know Fiora. Take Sharla. She lost her fiancé to the Mechon. But if Fiora's alive, that could mean he's alive. Melia has kind of fallen for Shulk since he saved her. And now the girl he cares about the most is bad. Her motivation isn't affected by this. She isn't going to leave because she can't fuck Shulk now. But it's definitely not going to improve her emotional state 
until she accepts that she's never going to be with Shulk. I am sorry, Melia fans. And hey, her dad dies during this, and that's great for her motivation. Horrible for her emotional state, but it's good for character building. Another character who doesn't get their motivation changed because of this reveal is good old hero pawn Ricky. But that's why I love Ricky. He's only here because he was told to come with us, and now he's our friend. Challenging the character's motivation like this is a great way to motivate the player to see the story through. And the only character that makes this twist land as hard as it does is Fiora. If it's some new character, the oh sh** faces or harms is still there, but ultimately, character motivation is unaffected. Monkar isn't big enough to make it land. Hell, if you remember him, you probably figure out he's metal faced by the end of the scene. Gatto would only really change Sharla's motivation. One thing those three options have in common is that the main character is left with one question. Is Fiora alive? Which is why it's her and there's no way it could not be her. Also, half the party is connected to her, so she's truly the best pick for this scene. While Fiora is the key to this reveal being so good, the foreshadowing for this twist is also perfect. Very early on, the game establishes that the Minato can't hurt Hans. With Fiora, funny enough, shortly after that, the faces are introduced and the Minato can't hurt them. If you just look at those two things about the Minato in a vacuum, you could probably figure out the answer. But that's not enough setup for a twist, which is why Zord exists. He builds up the face mech on more. He's the first one to talk and the first one that seems to have had a life prior to becoming a face. And before you can think about what he said for too long, Metal Face shows up. Even though he taunts you about the Minato not working on him, you're too focused on what's on screen to think about it. I don't think you're going to think about why the Minato doesn't work on the faces when the one that killed Fiora is right there. When you start getting the visions of Shulk murking Metal Face, you aren't going to think how the power-up is going to make that happen. You're just excited to chop his arm off. So much so when Zanza says you can hurt all life now, you don't think how that hints towards what's about to be revealed. The setup for the twist works so well because it's constantly dancing around the answer. It's always right there, like a good puzzle in a game. As soon as you see Fiora, you get that aha moment, and everything about the faces falls into place. Xenoblade is so tightly written. I find that it's rare for a game to be so long and to have so many scenes that have a clear purpose in the story. You can't cut out Zord kidnapping Juju. If you do, you're losing character building for Sharla. More importantly, the setup for the faces twist. You can't cut out any of the visions foreshadowing Prison Island because you need that moment dangled in front of you. So much happens during it, the game needs to get you excited for it. Especially when it's a vision that happens so far in advance. Lastly, the teasing for the rest of the game in this scene is a nice touch. By the end of the midpoint, you know the game has a lot more to it. It's just nice to see the game so upfront about setting up the last act. Especially when everything else about it it is pretty subtle for the most part. I just like while all of this payoff is happening, the game still takes its time to reassure you that there's a whole lot more to come. I don't want to get into it too much because talking about the last act of the game will balloon the length of the video. Zanza's lines are very deliberate in this scene and I'll just leave it at that. I'm planning on streaming this game at some point and I'm honestly so excited to see all of the moments of foreshadowing. At the end of the day, this moment is just exciting to experience. The boss fights are fun, and the story during it is amazing. It's one of the best moments in any JRPG, and it helps give Xenoblade Chronicles the reputation it has. Especially when it understands the key pillars of making an amazing moment in a game. Set up, pay off, and change everything. Do you agree? Think I'm an idiot? Comment down below. Dislike the video as Smash spoiled the Fiora reveal for you, and subscribe for more bad content. Follow me on other platforms if you want. Take care, guys. That's done, Banner over there.